Welcome. Let's go ahead and get started. We'll have, I know, some others that are still on their way and, and wander in, but um, let's, uh, let's begin. Uh, I want to uh, welcome you out today to our um, uh, uh, Weiser Center for Emerging Democracies uh, uh, lecture series. Today we're pleased to have with us uh, Professor Michael Coppedge, who uh, is a professor of political science at the University of uh, Notre Dame, uh, and also a faculty fellow there at the Kellogg Institute for International Studies. Uh, many of you probably know Michael through uh, either directly or indirectly as coders for the uh, Varieties of Democracy project, uh, of which he was one of the founders and is uh, uh, still one of the um, uh, uh, principal investigators. Uh, he has done an amazing, uh, produced an amazing public good for the discipline uh, and, uh, frankly, for the world over the last uh, several years, uh, taken up a lot of his, I, I know, time and effort and, and energy and um, delighted to have him here to talk about uh, um, some of the work that's growing out of uh, that product. Um, he is uh, um, a, a prolific scholar. His uh, two, two of the books that you may be aware of, uh, Democratization and Research Methods that came out from Cambridge uh, in 2012, uh, Strong Parties and Lame Ducks, uh, Presidential Partyarchy and Factionalism in Venezuela from uh, Stanford in 1994 and dozens and dozens of articles on democratization, uh, uh, Latin American political parties and elections, and increasingly uh, research uh, methods. We're delighted here to have, today to have him here to talk about uh, uh, varieties of democratic diffusion, colonial uh, alliance, and neighbor networks. I'm going to turn the floor over to Michael. Okay. I knew I would forget to turn this on. There we go. Okay, so thanks, Alan. And of course, everyone knows Alan has also produced a tremendous public good for Vedum as well, being the project manager who has primary responsibility for writing all the questions on political parties and for being uh, like the leader on everything having to do with, uh, with Asia. Um, okay, so I'm going to talk about democratic diffusion today. Um, I became interested in this in the late 1990s and Dan Brinks and I did an article on it in, um, in Comparative Political Studies in 1999, I think it was. No, 2002. Um, but we, we had to use Freedom House data at that point uh, because that was the best thing that we could, we could find at the time. But now we have VDEM data uh, and I'm working with some other people uh, using VDEM data to test similar kinds of models with different data. Uh, but also uh, looking at different, uh, even though the models are similar, we're looking at different kinds of international networks that might uh, serve as channels for the diffusion of democracy. Um, I've presented versions of this paper several times before, most recently, I guess, at the APSA meeting, or uh, uh, one of my co-authors, Ben Dennison, presented uh, a different version of it uh, at a VDEM conference at Notre Dame uh, in November. But there's some tweaks to this presentation that are not incorporated into the written paper yet. A couple of different analyses and I hope some clearer logic to explain uh, why we think we are getting close to some causal inference and in, uh, making these estimates. So I'm really highlighting that in this talk and, I'm, I, and I really want feedback about whether that's working or not. Uh, because I feel like um, when we were doing these kinds of analyses before, uh, we had good reasons for doing what we were doing, um, but we didn't explain them very well. Uh, and so now we're trying to insert this into the, the uh, causal identification revolution and communicate the logic of this uh, in a different way. Uh, without changing what we're doing, we're just saying, you know, um, here's, you know, here's why this should be meaningful to you. And I hope it will be persuasive. Anyway, short literature review. What we already knew about uh, democratic diffusion was that, uh, as many people had observed, levels of democracy are spatially clumped. Um, and regional neighbors seem to affect one another. Lots of people insert, like, average level of democracy for Latin America or Southeast Asia or something into their regression. And it usually turns out to be significant. Um, Membership in regional organizations tends to promote democracy, uh, according to John Peavy House. Um, <coughs> Levitsky and Way uh, make a big deal about linkage and leverage being two factors that, that shape whether or not uh, uh, former, uh, uh, well, whether or not uh, authoritarian, electoral authoritarian regimes uh, tend to democratize or not. 
uh, and then this earlier article, I guess it's a 2006 article, so that geographic neighbors tend to converge in their levels of democracy or non-democracy. Uh, but it's, it's not clear why this happens. Uh, so that's been one of the big drawbacks to the literature. Uh, this clumping happens, and there seems to be some, there are patterns that are consistent with spatial diffusion, but the causal mechanisms are not clear. And I still can't pin down causal me mechanisms, but I think we can move a little closer to inferring what the causal mechanisms might be by distinguishing different kinds of networks that link countries together. Um, so in this paper, this presentation, uh, we have some results about neighbor networks and military alliances and colonial networks, which are the most complex of all. We've done some other analyses that say that trading partners also tend to converge, um, but that military occupations don't seem to have any effect. So it's not like everything we test turns out positive. Um, so I'm going to talk about that. So to jump to conclusions, so you'll know what to be looking for, uh, we can find some conf uh, confirmation of convergence in levels of democracy among neighbors and also among allies, uh, and especially among neighboring allies. Um, <coughs> also, that electoral democracy tends to diffuse through some colonial networks, <coughs> primarily the oldest and longest lasting colonial networks, uh, colonial empires. Uh, and that colonizers tend to affect colonies more than colonies affect their colonizers. Um, and that convergence, which uh, is a product of positive diffusion, uh, that is, uh, if one country moves in one direction, another, the other countries in the network move in the same direction, and they tend to become, they tend to become uh, approach a similar level of democracy, that that is by far the most common pattern of diffusion in colonial networks. And that the, really the only network with convincing divergence uh, is uh, current Portuguese colonies of occupation affecting Portugal. Uh, and I think there's a good reason for that, which is that the decolonization struggle in Africa, uh, as is well known among people who study the, the Portuguese transition, that that was a major factor in precipitating the transition to democracy in Portugal the end of the corporatist regime. Like it, there was a rebellion among military officers who were being forced to fight colonial wars to hold on to the empire, and they overthrew the dictator to, uh, to stop that from happening. But at any rate, um, <coughs> one of the really formidable challenges uh, of making causal inferences about the impact of colonial rule on democratization is the fact that colonialism was not randomly assigned to countries. There were systematic differences, not only between colonizers and colonies, uh, but also between the advanced countries that built empires and those that didn't, and between the developing regions of the world that were, uh, I'll put this in quotation marks, selected for uh, cl colonial rule and those that maintained their sovereignty. Um, and if these differences are correlated with subsequent democratization, then inferences about the relationship between colonial rule and democracy will be biased. However, if we can correct for this selection bias, then we can consider a, uh, assignment to colonial rule uh, as if random, uh, as, as an and as if random treatment, and make uh, the comparisons across these balanced groups that come closer to causal inferences. Uh, so this is a way that we, that we have in this paper of correcting for long-term, relatively fixed kind of confounding. Um, and below, we're also going to rule out some kind of confounding for more short-term dynamic relationships. So a way to do this is, uh, first, uh, we mitigate long-term relatively fixed selection bias by comparing actual colonies to what I'll call potential colonies, that is, countries that were not colonies, uh, but were in a lot of other ways similar to countries that did actually become colonies. So that's one kind of comparison we do. And we also compare actual colonizers to other kinds of countries, uh, primarily you know, European or Northwestern wealthy white countries uh, that could in some alternate, alternate universe have become colonizers but did not for one reason or another. So we make those kinds of comparisons across these relatively comparable groups. And we use a Heckman selection model to correct for selection bias. Uh, 
in this process uh, to correct for the increased probability that certain kinds of countries will become colonizers or colonies. And then we confirm the comparability of the treatment and control groups after applying this correction. And I'll say more about that in a minute. So here's the selection stage of the model. So basically, to, to, uh, we try to, uh, to understand why certain countries became colonizers and why some became colonies. Uh, so uh, the countries that were likely to become colonizers were countries at northern latitudes, countries that had been great powers uh, after 1815, um, countries that were founded relatively long ago, um, and countries that were likely to be colonies were ones that are more southern latitudes, that were not great powers, that were islands, uh, and that had um, lower average elevations, uh, and that had neighbors, immediate geographic neighbors, that were colonies. Uh, so all those things are kind of exogenous predictors of being colonizers or being colonies. And using that information, we can calculate a probability of being a colonizer and the probability of being a colony. So I'm comparing those in this chart. So these are probabilities of being a colony. These are probabilities of being a colonizer. The gray countries are ones that were actually colonies or colonizers. The red ones are ones that are, are reference cases, like the control group. Um, and some are like control colonizers or potential colonizers, I call them, like the higher up this dimension like Russia, Finland it's especially, are potential colonizers that were not actually colonizers. And I'll say more about Russia in a minute. And these, uh, like uh, Liberia, Thailand, um, Ethiopia, Saudi Arabia, Yemen, Taiwan, Iran, uh, ones that were not actually colonies but were potentially colonies. And so this is what I mean by the, the, the actual versus potential control groups. Um, <coughs> now, you will probably say, well, Russia had an empire. Uh, you could also say Austria-Hungary had an empire. You could also say um, that the Ottoman Empire was an empire. So why weren't their subunits colonies? Why don't we treat those as actual colonies rather than uh, potential ones? Um, one reason is that we're making a distinction between uh, colonizers that had kind of far-flung colonies, ones that were far away from them, so Spain versus Latin America, uh, same for Portugal in both uh, the Americas and in Africa. Uh, the same for England, <coughs> which had, you know, the sun never set on its empire. Uh, France also had all over the world. And that's different from Russia that had an empire that was more contiguous to the homeland of Russia. Like there were growing and shrinking boundaries for the Russian Empire. Same for the Ottoman Empire. Uh, and the same, I think you could say, mostly for the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Um, so they're different in that sense. There's also um, a reason, there's a kind of a practical consideration, which is that we're using varieties of democracy data, and varieties of democracy chose not to code the subunits of the Russian, Ottoman, and Austro-Hungarian Empire before, uh, before independence, generally around 1918 or before 1989 in the case of the Soviet Union. Uh, so we don't have data to test those things but I would also say they're, they're, they're different. Um, we could look at, uh, for example, the relationship between Russia or the Soviet Union and, and other countries, you know, uh, at least nominally sovereign countries in Eastern Europe, for which we do have ratings uh, during that period, but we have other ways of looking at that relationship. So, for example, in the military alliances variable, that includes the Warsaw Pact. And so that's looking at the same kind of relationship between the Soviet Union and Warsaw Pact countries. And we also are looking at uh, immediate geographic neighbors. So to the extent that we have data about uh, other units that are contiguous to uh, a potential colonizer, that's included in the, the neighboring, neighbors variable. Okay, so, um, so here's what we do uh, to compare to see whether these, these actual and potential groups are balanced. Uh, I know this, there's much too much information on this chart, but here are some covariates, some things that, we, that one might think would be correlated both with democratization eventually and be correlated with the probability of being a colony or a colonizer or being selected into some kind of colonial network. Um, um, 
So uh, there's some economic variables like GDP per capita. You know, wealthy countries will more likely to be colonizers than colonies. They're also more likely to be democracies. Oil reserves uh, may have an impact. You know, countries that export a lot of oil on average tend not to be very democratic. Uh, and probably the potential for exploiting oil reserves has something to do with whether other powers want to capture that territory and exploit those reserves or whether they want to hold on to that territory, for example, Portugal and Angola. Uh, you could say the same thing. I'm not going to go through the logic for all of these, but you could say the same thing for a lot of these social indicators. You could say the same thing for civil war, internal conflict, and things like that. So here we have the mean value on these covariates for the treated countries, that is the actual, uh, in this case, colonizers, and the potential colonizers, and the same for the colonies. And here's the difference between the means for these treatment and control groups. And here's uh, basically a t-test uh, about whether these are significant differences. And what I would call attention to is that none of these p-values meets conventional levels of significance, except for this one about oil reserves for colonies. Apparently colonies tend to have larger, I mean, actual colonies tend to have larger oil reserves than potential colonies. No, the other way around. Uh, potential colonies tend to have higher oil reserves than uh, actual colonies. So and maybe in another version we'll include this as a control variable in the regression. But for the most part, uh, I, I feel pretty confident in arguing that the, the, the actual colonies or colonizers and the potential colonies and colonizers are balanced groups. Uh, there's they're, they're, um, they're very comparable with respect to a lot of covariates that could be confounders uh, creating selection bias. So a second issue um, is that uh, we, you know, this is an inherently challenging thing to do to look at relationships spanning more than 100 years for more than 100 countries, almost 200 countries, um, where the thing that you think produces the effect, colonial rule, has an impact many years later. Uh, and we would rather not specify, say, 50-year lag uh, to say that something that happened 50 years ago has an immediate impact on something that's happening today. I don't think that's a good way to theorize about this or model this. So we have another way of thinking about it, uh, which is that we think that colonial rule, which is just one of the kinds of networks we're looking at here, that colonial rule <coughs> created uh, networks, networks that link countries. Um, like they promote patterns of trade, patterns of uh, interaction, patterns of migration, sometimes shared language, sometimes shared religion, sometimes uh, shared educational patterns. There are just lots of different kinds of well-worn paths connecting countries. And those networks, even though they were created a long time ago, they persist. Maybe they decay over time. In fact, we kind of expect that to happen. Um, but the networks are created a long time ago but they continue to exist in the present. So in each current year that we're looking at, the network is still there, even though it was created a long time ago. But it doesn't, the network itself doesn't have a causal effect all by itself on current levels of democratization. Um, instead, what it does is interact with other things that might produce democratization. So um, they persist in the long term and then the existence of the network increases the probability that some members of the network influence other members of the network in the short term. Um, compared to the amount of influence you would see among countries that are not members of a network. So the existence of a network makes it more likely that countries will affect each other's levels of democracy. So specifically what we're looking at are networks like this. So this is the network of immediate geographic neighbors just connecting each country to its immediate neighbors. So that's one kind of network. Uh, and it has some, it suggests certain kinds of things that may matter uh, as causal mechanisms. So if, if, these, if this kind of network matters, then you expect that maybe trade matters because neighboring countries are more likely to trade with each other sometimes. Uh, they're more likely to have migration patterns that are, that are, uh, that are important. They're more likely to exchange information, like you know more about what's going on in your neighboring country. Like Americans tend to know a lot more about what's going on in Mexico than they do about what's going on in Cambodia, things like that. Um, 
but that's a different network than a network of military alliances. Um, so these are also more common among neighbors, but uh, when we estimate them, the neighbor effects are partial. Uh, I mean, this is part of partial data of the neighbor effects and vice versa. Uh, and these military alliances also bridge some regions. So for example, there are a lot of connections between the United States and a lot of countries in Western Europe. There are a lot of connections within the Middle East and North Africa. There are a lot of connections within West Africa. There are connections between the U.S. and even East Asia uh, and the, in Oceania, uh, Pacific. So it's, it's a really different kind of network connecting countries. Um, and uh, you could also say Asia is less connected by these sorts of military alliances. Um, and finally, um, we're also looking at networks of former colonies. And as you can see, this is a really different pattern of connection among countries. So these different patterns should be empirically distinguishable. We should, you know, if, if we find support for one kind of network uh, and not for another kind of network, it gives us some hints about why connections among countries matter. So former colonies, as I said before, could have things about uh, shared religion or language or information flows more likely to find trade and investment, um, borrowed institutions uh, could matter, and transmission of ideas and norms through education and through settlers even, and some kinds of colonies. So there are different patterns there. So here's how we model it. We're looking at uh, diffusion as a process of mutual adjustment in levels of democracy. So let's say we're looking at time zero, just any starting year. We have a source country that is, in this case, more democratic than a target country. So we think the source country affects the target country. So there's a gap between these two because source is more democratic than target. It's a positive gap. So source minus target is positive. In that situation, then if the coefficient for that gap is a positive coefficient, then the target country becomes more democratic. So, it, so the... Uh, the, the positive coefficient for positive gap raises the level of democracy in the target country. But if the coefficient of the gap is negative, then that pushes the target country down, and so that promotes a process of divergence, what you could call kind of a push-down effect. Um, but uh, if the, the gap between countries is negative, here we're reversing. So now the, the target country is more democratic than the source country, so it's a, it's a negative gap between those, and if there is a positive coefficient for that gap, then the target country becomes less democratic, which, strangely enough, is also convergence. They become closer together. Uh, and if the coefficient of the gap is negative, then you get um, the target country becoming more democratic, because a negative times a negative is a positive change, and that's divergence uh, or a push-up effect. Uh, but the simple rule is that if we get positive coefficients on these gaps, then that means convergence. Countries become closer together. They pull each other closer together. If we get negative coefficients for these gaps, then they push each other apart, and that means divergence. And that holds true regardless of whether the source or the target country is the more democratic country. Um, and for colonial networks, we, we model two different directions of influence. We model uh, uh, a periphery having an effect on the center uh, direction and a center having an effect on the periphery. So a periphery on the center is colonies having an effect on the colonizer. Center on the periphery is colonizers having an effect on colonies. Um, and for the, the latter, and excuse me, the former, periphery uh, affecting center, there are usually multiple source countries because there are m usually several colonies and a colonial <coughs> empire. And the way we model that is to average the gaps between the colonizer and each of the colonies and have that affect the change in democracy in the colonizer. But in the other direction, uh, center periphery, then it's just one colonizer that has basically a dyadic effect on each colony in the colonial network. Um, so the basic model is that gaps explain change. Um, <coughs> so a democracy gap between the actual source country or countries and the actual target country explains the change in democracy score in the target country two years later compared to changes in potential target countries. So we can look at that. Um, so here's the, 
this is the dependent variable, the change in country I between two years ago and now, and its level of democracy. And that is explained by these gaps. And, uh, notice here's the typo. It shouldn't be JITs. It just be JTs. Um, so uh, the, the uh, source country minus the target country, so the gap between those, that's the same here, the same term. Uh, so that the size of that gap explains the amount of change in the target country. But we're also making a, a difference between the actual, what we actually observe and the potential countries that we observe uh, because these are the emitted categories. So we only specify these variables and since we specify all of them for all the colonial networks in the same model, the emitted ones are the potential colonies and colonizers. And so that's the interpretation of the coefficients that we've got. So people talk a lot about differences and differences designs to try to analyze these. I think you could say this is a differences and differences and differences design because we have three different kinds of differences that we're looking at. And I think it's, I don't know, arguably well controlled. Um, here are some baseline models that don't have colonial networks in them yet. Um, a series of models, uh, we have some control variables for having a presidential election year because uh, democracy score changes are more likely in presidential election years. Uh, we have year dummies that I don't show here, but looks like there's one dummy for every year in the sample, which is like 115 dummies uh, that I'm not going to show. Um, control for per capita GDP in some models, never significant in this particular model. Uh, we also control for lit literacy as a, as a better proxy for level of development, or at least a one that we have more observations for, uh, and that is sometimes significant. So it's basically a proxy for a level of development. Um, and we find that neighbor networks are always significant and positive. That is, there appears to be convergence among neighbors. So basically, if you live in a democratic neighborhood, you tend to become more democratic. If you live in an authoritarian neighborhood, you tend to become more authoritarian. Uh, and the same for alliances. If you have, uh, if you belong to an alliance where your, your alliance partners are more democratic than you are, then you tend to become more democratic and vice versa. Yeah. Ten. Yes. Um, we don't actually. Uh, this is like the omitted category. So you've got a dummy variable. Uh, so if you're estimating a coefficient on a dummy variable, you're estimating a coefficient when it's one, but that's interpreted as the difference between uh, when the value is one and when the value is zero. So the zero is the emitted category. And the, the potential colonies are all the zeros uh, after you've controlled for all of the ones for all of the different colonial networks. But I have another little trick up my sleeve about pairing uh, actual and potential colonies that I'll show you in a minute. Okay. Because that's, that's an excellent thing to ask about. So the basic point here is that uh, the evidence from this model suggests that neighbor networks matter, alliance networks matter, and specifically uh, looking at these two things, if we have two hypothetical countries, a blue country and an orange country, and they, they, they start at the extremes of zero and one on this electoral democracy scale, um, then as time passes, if they are non-allied neighbors, there's their only neighbor effects going on here, they're not allies, we expect their democracy scores to converge, actually pretty rapidly. If they are allies that are not neighbors, we expect them to converge, but more slowly. And if they're neighboring allies, they converge really rapidly uh, in just the space of, what, six years, something like that. Uh, converge a lot. Um, now, about colonial diffusion. Uh, we def find like 54 different colonial diffusion variables. Uh, we have so many because uh, it's actually nine empires, not eight. Um, uh, so, you want to go back? Yes, yes. Mean it goes both ways. Yeah. Yes. 
um, at least on average, on average seven. Uh, so we have nine different empires. So we, we, we don't assume that all empires work the same. So maybe colonial rule, British colonial rule had a different impact, impact than Portuguese colonial rule or Belgian col colonial rule. In fact, they have reputations for this. You know, like the, the British were nicer, although some people say that's not really true. Uh, but like Belgian had a reputation for being particularly nasty uh, in the Congo, for example. Uh, so we assume that it could be different in different empires. We also make a distinction, as I said before, between the direction of influence from center to periphery or vice versa. Uh, we also distinguish between current colonies and former colonies. And by current, I mean the colon colony was uh, active at the time in the observed year. Not that it's, I don't mean that it, it's a colony still today. It's kind of current in the sense of current dollars um, versus former colonies, ones that used to be colonies but are no longer. Because we had an expectation that maybe colonial rule had a bigger impact for current colonies than it does many years after independence. Um, and we also distinguish three types, oops, three types of colony for the large empires, British, French, Spanish, and Portuguese. So this is a distinction that uh, several people have made. Um, people often distinguish colonies as settlement from other kinds of colonies. So, you know, Australia, Canada, the U.S., different kind of colonial experience than Ghana or South Africa versus Zambia. Different, different story. Uh, people often talk about colonies of occupation uh, in which uh, there are not many settlers there. There's just like a, a layer of administrative officials who kind of dominate and extract resources from a subject population. And uh, Kunle Owalawi has also made a distinction uh, about forced settlement colonies. Colonies like in, in the uh, English-speaking Caribbean, um, or in Haiti, or in some islands off the coast of Africa where there was an imported slave population, um, which he says had a different experience than the, the classic colonies of occupation. So we don't assume that all of these different kinds of colonies work the same. The, we think that, in fact, they may have different uh, impacts on uh, eventual democratization. So we relax the assumption that they're the same and try to get different estimates for each, each kind for the major empires. Um, now, here's another problem, um, which is um, uh, another potential problem. We already looked at uh, kind of static, fixed, so possible selection bias. Uh, about uh, an association between which countries are likely to be in a colonial network and which ones are likely to become democratic uh, on average over a long period of time. But because our model is looking at really short-term relationships, so it's like looking, trying, we're, what we're trying to explain is the change in levels of democracy in the last two years. So it's just a very recent short-term kind of change. And we're looking at things that happened two years ago trying to explain that. Um, there's still a problem, I mean, a potential for selection bias, even with a lot of differencing like that. So, for example, there could be major global events that affect a lot of countries at the same time. Things like World War, like, you know, you know at the end of World War I, suffrage expanded in a lot of countries uh, around the same time, and that could produce uh, a spurious correlation between uh, changes in democracy in different countries. The spread of fascism in the interwar period, decolonization in the 1950s, 1960s, in even into the 1970s in some cases, uh, the Great Depression, technological in uh, innovation, falling trade barriers, all these kind of things could create, could induce spurious correlation and changes in countries around the same time. Um, so it could create a spurious correlation between the change in colonizers and change in colonies in the short term whether we're talking about actual or potential ones. You could also get a similar kind of spurious correlation for completely different reasons. Like it could be that DDIM has measurement bias that has something to do with time. So it may be that um, all of the VDM coders, regardless of which countries they're coding, might say, well, this is the interwar period. Fascism was rising in Europe, but we're going to expect to see democracy suffer even in Brazil. As a matter of fact, the, the Estado Novo had overtones of uh, the corporatist state in Portugal. Um, 
or you can you know you might expect to find that in Bolivia, even though they're really I don't, I don't know there was a Bolivian socialist flange that uh, had some popularity for a while. Um, anyway, the coders could falsely perceive changes in democracy just because they expect it because of what they know about what's going on other places in the world. So there could be measurement bias that could lead to that. Yeah, Nate. Some cases, maybe so, but if if so, we're underestimating okay. potential impact of. So it's a it's a conservative strategy for dealing with that kind of bias. I'm I'm not sure how to how to you know let the let the good stuff in without letting the bad stuff in too. So we're trying to be pretty conservative. Um, so another potential problem is that if you look at the equation that we've got, you know, like we're having gaps explain change, and um, so the level of democracy in country I at time t minus 1 is on the left-hand side of the equation and it's on the right-hand side of the equation. It's used to calculate the change and it's used to calculate the gap. And so you would think, well, the same information is on both sides of the equation so that it's necessarily going to be correlated. So that's the kind of spurious correlation that we don't need uh, and it would be a problem. So what do we do about this possibility of spurious correlation? Uh, well, here's an illustration of it. So if we've got uh, some related events at the same time, X1 and X2, that affect democratization of the colonizers, and this one affects democratization of the colonies, and these two things are correlated with each other, it can create the illusion of a correlation between these two things uh, that would be spurious. So we're trying to rule that out. Um, so one thing that we do about it uh, is to use year dummies. So basically we're correcting for uh, any annual <coughs> deviation from the mean change in democracy. Uh, so, you know, if there's, there's, if there's for some reason like the end of World War I or the end of World War II, where a lot of countries move in the same direction, we're basically canceling that out and saying we're not going to count that as a diffusion effect. That's something else that's going on and maybe it's too conservative, but we're, we're just going to ignore that. And I think actually these, these year dummies probably do the best job of dealing with this problem, a uh, better job than the other things. But we also do placebo tests, and this is not a correction, but it's something to reassure us that we don't have th these kinds of problems. So think about it. If these kinds of spurious associations exist in the short term, then they wouldn't be confined to specific colonial networks. These would be big changes that would be affecting a lot of wealthy industrialized countries, whether, whether they have colonies or not. And they would be affecting a lot of developing countries, whether they're colonies or not. They would have effects on a lot of these things. And so if, if these spurious associations exist, we would expect to find them even if countries don't belong to the same colonial network. Uh, and if we, if we model this for a kind of randomized hypothetical colonial networks and we don't find these spurious correlations, then we can rule out that kind of bias and stop worrying about it. So what we did is a placebo test. Uh, well, actually four different placebo tests. So one is in this panel here. We assigned some actual colonies to actual colonizers, but we did it randomly. So we like threw all the British, French, Spanish, Portuguese, Belgian, et cetera, colonies into the hopper, randomly mixed them up, and reassigned them to other colonizers. Um, and repeated that again and again, three times. Estimated our model to see you know, whether there are diffusion effects in these randomly generated assignments of colonies to colonizers. And find that no, none of these relationships is significant. So this is a coefficient plot. If it crosses the red line in the middle, it's not significant. We also did it a different way because it's not exactly clear how to do this placebo test. So we also assigned non-colonies randomly to actual colonizers, so countries that potentially were colonies but actually were not. We assigned them to actual colonizers and also find that there was no impact there. We also tried assigning 
actual colonies randomly to fake colonizers. So here we kind of had to invent some empires. So is, is the Swiss Empire, Danish Empire, Swedish, Norwegian, Austri Austrian, Canadian, Hungarian, Turkish, and Russian empires. So we assigned some actual colonies to these fake empires. No effect. And we assigned some non-colonies randomly to fake colonizers. Uh, and again, no effect there. So I mean, these placebo tests become less and less plausible. But the major point is that um, unless you assign actual colonies to their actual colonizer, you don't get any of, any of these uh, estimated diffusion effects. And so if that, I mean, given this evidence, I would say that <coughs> even though there are good reasons to be afraid that there would be this kind of short-term spurious correlation, we don't see any evidence of that. Um, uh, so I, I, you know, even though there are good reasons to worry about it, I don't think it's going on. So um, that's basically what I'm saying. So we can more confidently attribute these effects to membership in these specific actual colonial networks. Uh, we also have some expectations about which of these colonial ties should be, uh, uh, well, diffusion, yeah, colonial ties should be significant. I mean, I don't, I don't expect that every hypothesis we test about colonial uh, diffusion is going to pan out. Uh, some are more likely to be true than others. So uh, we expect that colonizers are more likely to affect the colonies than the colonies are to affect the colonizers because the colonies are a mixed bag of countries with a lot of different experiences. And so they send a, a more confused, muted signal to the colony than in the other direction where there's one country sending the same clear signal to all of its colonies. We also expect that um, a long colonial experience is more likely to have an impact than a short, brief colonial experience. So the ones that have the longest experience are like Spain, Portugal, uh, France, and the Netherlands. They have really, really old colonies. I was calculating this last night, and uh, like Cape, Cape Verde, uh, it's like over 500 years of colonial rule. That's really different from like um, Belgian colonies and after Rwanda, Burundi, where they were there 35 years or so. Um, so that's a really different impact. Or, you know, the U.S. and Cuba, which we count as basically, I think it's four years, something like it, 1898 to 1902. So you don't expect much of an influence in a situation like that. Um, so here are some estimates. So these are estimates for the center periphery direction. Uh, we distinguish three different types of colony, settlement versus forced settlement versus occupation. Uh, it's also other networks, neighbors and alliances, which you see are positive and significant. Um, within each type of colony, we distinguish uh, the, the empire, British, French, Portuguese, Spanish, uh, and current and former, although these, not all the possible options exist, um, but except for colonies of occupation, you get current and former, British, French, Portuguese, Spanish, et cetera. Except for Spain, we don't have current Spanish colonies in our sample because the sample starts in 1900 and all of the Spanish colonies had become independent before 1900. So at any rate, <coughs> one implication of, of this set of estimates is that colonizers affected colonies more than colonies affected colonizers. In this case, half of these relationships are significant. Uh, the, the orange dots denote significant. Um, and almost all of them are positive, meaning that Colonies and colonizers, uh, let me say that the influence of colonizers was to basically pull up the colonies and help them become more democratic. That's the implication of this model, which I have to say uh, is not exactly what I expected. I thought it was equally likely that, you know, the, like the, um, the negative story of colonial rule having a negative impact on colonies, uh, uh, exploiting them keeping them undeveloped, uh, depriving them of rights, being repressive. You know, you would expect that colonial rule might have some negative consequences and push them down. Or that, uh, well, anyway, uh, but we find mostly positive convergence. Yeah. Uh, do you think that's because of the magnitude of the colonial um, experience? So, uh, like, the, the, ga the maximum gap between two countries would be one. And these coefficients, which range, oops, which range from, I don't know, zero to 
three or so, it's how much of a change you would expect in the target country over a two-year period uh, after it's multiplied times the size of the gap. So um, in, in this extreme case of former Portuguese colonies with forced settlement, that would mean that if there had been a gap of one, which is more than there actually was, then that would have changed um, the uh, ch would have changed the democracy score in the colony uh, by about 0.25 or so uh, over a two-year period, out of a maximum possible change of one. Um, this is the periphery center direction of the relationship, and there's some extreme values here for uh, current Portuguese colonies of forced settlement and occupation. They're really large for kind of idiosyncratic reasons, and I'll say a little bit about that in a minute. Uh, but excluding the, port the current Portuguese one so that we can see actually see the sizes of the other coefficients uh, on a different scale. Um, fewer of these relationships are significant. Um, it was about half in the other situation. It's only, it's less than a third in this case. And it's, you know, it's kind of, um, I mean, it's, it's significant that they're not significant, given that we're dealing with a sample of about 13,000 cases where, you know, almost everything you would test would become significant. But this is not significant. I think that means something, that uh, the periphery center direction is not a really powerful uh, direction of colonial influence. And uh, about half, well, four of the eight significant ones uh, relationships are positive and the other half are negative. Uh, we also find some evidence that the, the length of colonial rule ha affects the probability that a coefficient is significant in this model. So the longer colonial rule lasted, the higher the probability that it's going to be significant. So that is consistent with our expectation. Um, but another thing to take into consideration is if we're, if we're really interested in understanding whether there's convergence or divergence going on, uh, the fact that some of the coefficients we saw in the previous chart were negative doesn't mean that there's overall divergence going on because that depends on the relative sizes of the positive and the negative coefficients in both directions. So we, can we have to look at the size of the center periphery coefficient and add it to the size of the coefficient for the periphery center direction to come up with a net tendency and then do a t-test to figure out whether this is a significant net tendency. And so what we find looking at the net differences is that uh, nine of the 11 significant net tendencies indicate convergence. One of them, which is French forced settlement, is really not a credible uh, uh, relationship if you look at the history of what was going on between France and I think Haiti is the only case of French forced settlement. Uh, there. Uh, it's really not credible. Um, but Portugal's is. Um, because as I said before, there was a decolonization process. Like Portugal founded its colonies earliest of, of all the colonial empires beginning in the 1400s. Uh, and it delayed decolonization until the 1970s. Uh, thanks, Jim. Um, and I, it held on to its colonial empire much longer than, uh, than other colonial um, empires did, and it began having to fight really brutal wars of colonial domination to try to hold on to colonial rule. And that caused political crisis at home, which actually triggered the transition to democracy in Portugal. So that's a really different situation than we found in the other kinds of cases. But there is, I think, a causal relationship between the gap and the democratization in Portugal. Um, now, one of the surprising implications of this is that, you know, the British colonies have, I mean, the British Empire has a reputation for being good for democracy. Uh, this is a, a line of thinking that's been around for a long time, but as, uh, especially was emphasized in the early 1960s uh, when people were coming up with this hypothesis. Um, and what our estimates show is that British colonies of occupation have are significant and positive in the center periphery direction both in current colonies and former colonies. So in occupation, yes. But we don't find that for colonies of settlement and forced settlement uh, because most of these had matched the United Kingdom in their levels of democracy 
before they enter our sample in 1900. That is, they became independent earlier, um, and so we don't expect to estimate much of an effect that's going on there because the gap is really small uh, during the whole time they're in the sample. But also, if you kind of replicate the kinds of analysis that people were doing, for example, Boland and Jackman in 1980 used Ken Boland's data from uh, levels of democracy in 1965. And if you just look at uh, this, the size of those relationships, in 1965, you know, just the fact of being a British colony or having been a former British colony did have a significant relationship with the level of democracy in 1965. I think that's because, you know, immediately after independence, around 19, well, between 1956 and 1964 for most British African colonies, um, you know, initially there was some democratization after independence, but it soon gave way to single party rule by strongmen. Um, and so it's an effect that disappeared. Uh, we also find an effect of per capita GDP, et cetera, uh, negative impact of Portuguese colonies, uh, kind of conventional wisdom. But if you look at much later data, so a 2010 cross-section instead of a 1965 cross-section, then none of these relationships is significant except for per capita GDP and maybe growth having a negative effect. Um, so oh, actually there's positive thing for Spanish colony by, by 2010, which is consistent with what Huntington was saying about the third wave of democracy. Uh, so conclusions, uh, basically neighbors tend to converge, allies tend to converge, allied neighbors tend to converge rapidly. Uh, and some colonial networks have also promoted convergence, especially long lasting colonial networks and especially in the center to periphery direction. And Portugal is the big exception uh, that its resistance to decolonization promoted divergence from some of its African colonies. So those are conclusions at this point. Can I give you time for having any more questions? Sure. Uh, tell, tell, me, tell me your name if I haven't met you, or maybe even if I have. <laughs> Ellie, you have a question. Thank you. I'm trying to think of the Okay, well, if you're not ready, somebody else can. With the equation? I actually heard you before that when you were talking about the um, potential colonizers. Sorry, these potential slides move slow. What I want to know is that I'm imagining your, um, so in the part of the equation, which is the potential colonizers. This one? It's not a mean level of democracy. Okay, okay so what then what is it? Yes, I'm talking about that, that, that thing for the potential. Well, maybe I do need to look at the equation. Um, because then I would want to know what the threshold was to be considered a colonizer. Okay, or well, let me, right? I can answer that question easily. On, on, so that there's this probability thing that's yeah. Yeah. right? Yeah, so, so um, this is kind of arbitrary, true. but I used a cutoff of 40%. So things inside this box were considered neither likely colonizers nor likely colonies okay. so for the purpose of producing that, yes. that table, so comparing the treatment and control groups. So these so were are the ones. To the cluster of the Czech medicine is completely absent in that space. Yeah, but Finland and Russia are included in that. Yes, but for many years. Okay, but so given the, the entire example, that's pretty potentially colonizing. It is. And, the, and then the geographic is potentially neighbor. I mean, so. Well, what should I do? Should I go down to point two for colonizers? 
and I and I even used these in the placebo test. Mm -hmm. But actually, similar to the parental cerebral colonizing, so then they could just as well whether they use the person. Well, I actually, I kind of at first divided things along this line and assigned them to be uh, either more likely to be a colony or more likely to be colonizing. But then I also established a threshold of 0.4 because I, th I felt a little bad about saying if some if a country has a 30% chance of being a colonizer, I should treat it as a colonizer. But I hear you that, you know, what Finland and Russia are the two cases. I mean, you know, there will be different justifications. <laughs> I think that would be even more restrictive, <coughs> wouldn't it? I don't, I don't know, maybe it's not. I'm just trying to think of ways that you, you could be treating a, an aborted person eating um, so that you have a larger group of colonizers, right? Because otherwise you're, you're just selecting. Maybe, maybe that's a small end and you can just make sure. I'm open to that. I mean, but I think the only way to do it would be to lower the threshold here. That's true. So they could do some robustness checks with the threshold. What? Why exactly does it matter that they're contiguous? Well, but it, for this, for this analysis, what I'm trying to do is. Um, Established that they are comparable with respect to certain exogenous covariates. And I don't think contiguity matters for that. Oh, no, there's one variable that is that does matter for that, which is having a, a neighbor that's a colony. And I guess maybe latitude could maybe factor in. So, what is it? Here. Which is the same as that. I mean, and it should be JT, not JIT. So, I can, I can still look for potential. Either there's no gap between um, mean and. So, I'd have to. I'm, I'm getting ready to do that. Okay, the, um, the zeros are uh, like coded into the, the identification, uh, coded into the, um, into the network, into defining the network. So for example, it's, it's kind of a mega complex version of if you've got uh, a three level ordinal variable and you don't want to put it on the right-hand side of your regression, you turn it into two dummy variables, and then one of those levels is omitted. 
and that becomes the reference category. And so the interpretation of the coefficient for one level is the difference between that level and the omitted category. And the effect of the, the third level is the difference between the coefficients for that and the omitted category. And so in this case, we had dummy variables for all of the 54 colonial networks. And all of them had the same omitted category, which is non-colonial cases. So that's where the zero comes from. The implicit comparison is always between the actual versus potential, potential um, colonies or colonizers. Yeah, not here. There, there's not. Here there are. Uh, but in a sense, there are dyads because there are other variables in the model. So the two selection correction variables, one is based on the probability of being a colonizer, and one is based on the probability of being a colony. And so if we're controlling for those things, we're also making a differentiation between the reference countries ones that are more likely to be colonies and ones that are more likely to be colonizers. And so I would, in that sense, there is a difference going on in the, in the, you know, the, the potential groups. Uh, I, this may help. Um, you could imagine a matrix uh, where you have simply one, two, and three, one, two, and three. These things are uh, taken out. And so here we say that these things are all filled with zeros and ones to define the network. So, so in this network, uh, countries one and three are in the same network, but countries one and two are not in the same work, and countries two and three are not in the same network. So they're in the same network if they're, if they're coded one here. So there's a matrix of memberships and networks, and this matrix is interacted with or multiplied by the, the gaps in democracy scores between these two countries, and those things are the regressors in the model except that we've got, you know, 54 of these different networks. So each one has its own matrix, and they're all multiplied by the gaps, and that's where the regressors come from. Does that, does that? No, no, we put all of these, all of the diffusion variables in the same model at the same time. And, and, that I, and I think it's important to do that because that's the only way that the reference category will be the same for all the countries that we're estimating for. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and f for, uh, for neighbors, it would be strictly an adjacency matrix, but for colonial networks, it's not. They're not adjacent. Geographically adjacent, but they're. Yeah, okay. That's a really good question. Um, well, so we have to think about how are colonies different from sovereign countries? Um, 
one thing that's obviously different is that they're not sovereign. Uh, and so uh, VDEM also has variables that measure sovereignty, uh, state control of territory and population and an international um, autonomy and domestic autonomy, how much control they have over their own policy uh, in their own territory. And so we have some variables for that, but I don't use those in this model. So, uh, I mean, if somebody wanted to incorporate ideas of sovereignty or autonomy into their measures of democracy, they could use these variables to do that. But this model doesn't, this analysis doesn't do that. So there are other respects in which um, colonies uh, are probably different from sovereign countries. The main one being that they don't elect their head of government. Um, uh, we don't have democratic elected head of government or head of state. There's, there, there's a foreign power that either <coughs> governs them directly or appoints their governor general or whoever is uh, the main executive there. So uh, the democracy score in any colony that's in that situation is going to take a big hit for that reason alone. Uh, I think that's the only thing that's probably necessarily different about a colony, although it shares that in common with you know, hereditary monarchies where the monarch actually ruled. Um, uh, but, but there are other things that are likely to be different in colonies. Uh, uh, like legislature if, uh, may not exist, or if it does exist, it probably doesn't have very much power. Um, there often are not elections, or if there are elections, there are elections with, you know, just, just a small class of settlers, and where indigenous population has no vote. Uh, that often happens, um, say, in French West Africa until the 1950s. Uh, there are situations where, you know, the colonial government can be very repressive uh, and not allow independent organizations to form, uh, not allow opposition parties. You know, there, there are a host of things that are probably less democratic in the colonial situation. But what we're trying to do in VDEM in VDEM coding is to uh, allow colonial regimes to get credit for being democratic in certain ways if they really were, like if they actually had elections uh, or if they had political parties, especially opposition political parties, if they had a free press, if there was some freedom of discussion, they should get credit for that. But um, they can't be considered fully democratic as long as they don't choose their own government. Yeah. So we're basically trying to pinpoint what exactly is different, less democratic or equally democratic about colonial <coughs> rule. That is an excellent question. Um, there's a surprising amount of change in uh, levels of democracy, even in the supposedly most democratic countries over the course of the 20th century. Uh, so for the United States, for example, if you look at uh, our polyarchy index, it goes from zero to one. The United States enters in 1900 at about 0.4. It never gets to one, it gets to 0.9 approximately. Um, but there's, there, there's a major, I'm going to do it from your perspective. So there's a major improvement in 1920 when, you kn when women get the vote. There are further improvements in electoral democracy uh, in the middle of the 1960s with the Voting Rights Act uh, and further improvements in the 1970s as there was more autonomy for civil society organization and as women became more empowered. Uh, and gradual improvements after that with gradual equality and this and that. Uh, so there's, there, there's a really significant process of democratization in democracies over the course of the 20th century. So that's the case for the relatively democratic countries. But there are some other colonial powers that have really different patterns. So Spain and Portugal, for example, you know, Spain had experience with the Second Republic where it became pretty democratic in the 1930s, early uh, you know, 1930s, um, before Franco won the Civil War and established an authoritarian regime that lasted into the 1970s. So there, there's a lot of variation in levels of Spanish democracy. Um, Portugal kind of stays really low for a long time until the, the revolution, 1974, and then improves quite a bit after that point. Um, other places like you know the Netherlands uh, during the Second World War, Netherlands had been one of the relatively democratic countries uh, in, up until the 1930s, uh, but it takes a big hit with, with German occupation. 
really dips down and then goes up after that. Uh, so there's, there's, there is real variance going on among colonizers in every case. For different reasons. Yeah, I mean, just to the last point here, you talked about sort of the work that was like labor demands for like that's what's going to bring us to poverty and like things like this. And you did a few minute pieces about that. So yeah, with with some with some grimacing, yeah. Hearing this book run, <laughs> this book run hinges on like what Park is not all that. Right? Yes. So he's not like writing about the oppressed in the way that this book is about the oppressed. Yeah. Not it it is a It is different, but I want to be as precise as I can about what it's saying. It's saying that because this network was established during a period of colonial rule, which may have been a really exploitative and harmful period of colonial rule, but the existence of that network made it more possible for gaps between colonizers and colonies or former colonizers and colonies to exert a positive influence in the short term on colonies. And some <coughs> in some cases, the other direction as well. I think your hand is up first. I completely agree. We, uh, that's something we've always intended to do and haven't gotten around to yet. Uh, I think now that we're feeling like we've kind of got the model right, we can start looking at these alternative relationships. Now that we have new files and everything for it, we can start testing that pretty easily. But it's, it's a really good thing to explore. And, and not just disaggregating electoral democracy, but also seeing whether liberal democracy, participatory democracy, egalitarian democracy, whether those different other kinds of democracy diffused in the same way or different ways. I, I, was, par I was particularly interested in, 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 in thinking about the differences between electoral democracy in the U.S. and other liberal versus participatory democracy measures because when, when you're saying that the literature talks about the Eastern soldiers were supposedly inherited from the British uh, Empire, I was thinking, well, it's uh, most of the stuff that we read that's been done is Uh, the guarantees of rights and some yeah. I, I, for British I wouldn't say checks and balances but but you know if it's American maybe so No, I'm, I'm, I'm intrigued. Why would we do that? Well, I, I mean, you have the hypothesis, or you have evidence that the, the match is between um, geography in this case and relative to the uh, population. Um, and you have that as a hypothesis that, that you know, quantifies the risk that you're trying to play. I would think intuitively that uh, you would need to have some idea that uh, the, the, the former colony Okay, um, I, I think I understand. So, you know, when I was showing the chart about the rates of convergence for neighbors and allies and allied neighbors, um, that is based on an additive relationship, and it's not based on an interaction between the two. So, basically, you have a coefficient for the neighbor effect, and you have a different coefficient for the uh, alliance effect. 
Uh, and so this coefficient produces some rate, this produces some rate, and the, the sum of the two coefficients produces a stronger rate of, conver of conversion. But you could add uh, alliances, alliance coefficients to colonial coefficients and look at you know, different rates of convergence. Um, I'm not sure what it would mean to multiply the variables and then estimate the coefficient. Uh, we treat those as military occupations, and we don't have the military occupation variable in these models, or well, in this model, uh, but we did include it in some earlier models, and it was never significant. So is that why then? And, and also, this would interest you, but we also treat uh, Japan's domination of, of neighboring yeah. countries as military occupations okay. rather than so colonies. That's why South Korea is high on that yeah. Scale. The year dummies? The year dummies, sorry, yeah, the year dummies. Um, so I'm curious about whether you're going to look, uh, look at a, a period of practice where they capture uh, where they model something and things like that, whether they're going to um, World War II, uh, the 1911s, the Corvée of the 90s. Um, but I'm, wonder, I'm wondering if you're seeing uh, other evidence of other sort of mm -hmm. um, uh, non monotonic sort of movement. Yeah, that's a fair question uh, because there are reasons to believe that um, diffusion mechanisms or diffusion processes are different in different points in history. You know, that's that's both one of the benefits and the drawbacks of VDM data is it covers such a long period of time, but there could be causal heterogeneity over such a long period of time <coughs> because the nature of these relationships can change. In particular, you know, um, you know. If people are traveling by by sea, mm -hmm. <laughs> it takes a long time for an influence to get across the Atlantic Ocean, or to travel to the Pacific. Um, so you'd expect diffusion to be a slower process early in the 20th century than a much more rapid process in the Internet age. Um, so you know we that's one reason that you might want to do that. And there's plus there's flow of information through radio and TV and other things besides the internet even before that. Um, so yeah, in, in an earlier stage of this, we did um, um, get some separate estimates for different historical periods. Um, and I, if I remember correctly, I basically it got two different periods and but changed what, what the cutoff was, like before and after 1945 before and after 1930, before and after 1980, something like that, and got different coefficients for the different periods there. And it's kind of discouraging because you get different coefficients and you get different results if you estimate them separately for different historical periods. At least we were at that time. I'm, I think that model, I mean, we changed some pretty fundamental things about the way we estimated these relationships when we did that. So I guess we need to do it again to see if that is still the case or maybe it's so well designed and controlled now <laughs> that, that we don't have to worry about that. That would be nice, but um, uh, I don't know. I'm kind of hoping to avoid that issue <laughs> because it feels like it's complicated enough already, but uh, maybe um, maybe after I publish this version then I can look at that. <laughs> yeah. Are you involved in that? No, not yet. Okay. Well, data collection <laughs> is going on right now. Um, it's yeah. For those who don't know, the, there's a historical VDM project that's being led by Jan Terrell and Carl Hendrik Knudsen, with some involvement from um, Dan Ziblatt and a bunch of other people. John Gehring's involved. 
too. I'm not. I'm really just very peripherally involved in that project. Um, but the idea is to ex extend back the coding of countries to at least 1800, where countries existed, uh, and in some cases to 1789. Uh, obviously, can't do as many countries then because they didn't exist, um, and nobody knows much about what was going on in in West Africa in 1873. Uh, uh, so there are fewer countries. I think it's about 60 countries that are being coded. Also, there are complications because, you know, what do you do with Italy? What do you do with Germany before unification? And they're not coding uh, absolutely every principality in those, in those regions. Uh, what? No, no. But they're doing, they're, doing, they're doing several for Italy and they're doing several for Germany. Uh, like the, the major, most important ones. Another difference is that they're, uh, they don't have multiple experts because you just can't find multiple experts on Tuscany in the 19th century um, to code all these aspects of democracy. But anyway, they have found <coughs> at least one expert, well they have found one expert for, uh, actually sometimes they have multiple experts because they cover different areas. So some people know about elections and some people know about the media. And so they get different experts to code different things. But anyway, they've recruited I believe all the experts and some of them have finished their work and some of them are still going. Um, they have quite a bit of data there. Uh, these, uh, like because we don't have multiple coders, it's, it's really especially important in this phase of coding to rely on vignettes to establish some comparability of coder thresholds. And so all of them are doing vignettes on all the questions that they're coding. Um, well, actually, I'm not, I'm not positive it's all the questions, but they're, they're all doing vignettes to establish some comparability. Um, uh, we're expecting that the coding will be finished early this year. Um, there's also been a lot of work done on, the, on modifying our measurement model um, so that we can combine the original VDM data with the historical VDM data. And that has proven to be kind of tricky because if you're just thinking about the 19th century, you have a really different um, framework in mind than if you're looking at the 20th century and beyond. Uh, so that you're basically your standards low, get lower. Um, and we were hoping that the vignettes, because they're using the same vignettes before and after, we were hoping that the vignettes would solve this problem, but they didn't. Because uh, even if you're answering vignette questions, you're also having a, a different set of standards in mind. Um, but we, uh, the, the measurement model has been modified uh, for combining 19th century and 20th century data. And also there's an overlap, there's a 20 year overlap in the two data sets. So 1900 to 1920 is coded in both data sets. So that provides some overlap that helps smooth things out. Um, anyway, uh, I'm told I haven't played around with the data yet, but I'm told that it's working and uh, the data collection is going forward. It's pretty much on track. I mean, everything's a little bit late, but it will be finished and it should be credible and it will be available later this year. <laughs>